we're talking about change and uncertainty, and you have demonstrated that you have the ability to adapt. So bravo to everybody. And so for everybody that has chosen to attend today, just know I'm sending you a warm welcome, a virtual hug through cyberspace. I'm a very relational person, so I would love to be with all of you, but um, we're together in spirit, and that's a good thing. But today we gather because we're here to celebrate you as caregivers, you as family caregivers, and then also I'm celebrating the professional caregivers that are involved in this program. We're also here to honor you, and we are here to pamper you for just a little bit. Now, for those of you that aren't familiar with me, just a really quick summary. I have a company, Cardinal LLC, and I serve as an educational consultant. I wanna thank AARP Colorado for sponsoring my efforts today. They're a great collaborative partner, and I'm very blessed to work with amazing organizations and individuals throughout the state of Colorado, and certainly Kent is at the top of that list. Now, I worked in hospice and palliative care for a period of time as a chaplain and an educator. I've been in finance. I worked in the oil patch as geologist. But really, the important thing today is this. I am standing on common ground with you because I started out as a family caregiver when I was 15. And so I'm by nature, nurture, and necessity a caregiver. And just like you, I learned very quickly and very early in life that change and uncertainty, that's caregiving. That is what we are up against in this journey when we are caring for people that we love, our family, our friends, our extended family. Now, furthermore, it's not just caregiving that is about change and uncertainty. That is in the inherent nature of life, isn't it? And so today, what we're gonna talk about is how do we typically deal with change and uncertainty? And what we're gonna recognize is that most human beings don't like it. <laughs> We're uncomfortable with it. And sometimes we don't deal with it very effectively. So for our time together today, these are our points of discussion. And we're gonna do a high flyover on this for sure. But we're just gonna highlight the inherent nature of life. It is about change and uncertainty. And then we're gonna recognize why we're typically resistant to change. We kind of dig in our heels. We're gonna explore the process of change because I think knowledge is power. And if we understand how change happens and then unfolds, then perhaps we can deal with it more effectively. And then finally, I'm going to discuss what I call the three R's to deal with change and uncertainty. And these are things that have served me well over the years, and I hope will serve you well in addition. So let's start off by considering what we've been through over the last 14 months. And we've all been through a lot of change and uncertainty. But COVID highlights what caregivers already know. They know that doesn't matter how much change you've had up until this moment in time, there are still changes ahead, right? So get ready, we're going to encounter more. And that's because the journey of life is uncertain. Even when we feel we have things somewhat under control, we know that it's not gonna be straight and narrow. We know they're gonna be twists and turns. And COVID adds just another layer of complexity and uncertainty to this journey. And so we are experiencing the proverbial domino effect. One change leads to another change, which leads to another change. So as a caregiver, does that sound familiar? Does that ring true to you? Well, I imagine it would. And when we have change after change after change, it's exhausting. Now, many caregivers experience this because you're caring for someone who has a chronic or a progressive condition. And so just when you think everything is kind of calming down and you have a new sense of normal, something happens. And so you have to adapt to that change. So it's not uncommon for our family caregivers to experience what is called change fatigue. And perhaps you resonate with that. Now, due to COVID, the journey of caregiving presents new challenges in addition to all of the previous challenges that you had. I would imagine many of you experienced an enhanced sense of isolation and loneliness over the last 14 months. Because when COVID landed on our shores, we took actions to mitigate the risk of contracting this virus. We wanted to protect our loved ones and ourselves. 
since we were the caregivers. Perhaps you have a care receiver that actually lives in a long-term care community. And that happened early on where those facilities oftentimes had to close down and limit access of family and friends from coming and going, again, for the safety of all concerned. But certainly the impact of that chronic loneliness has affected people cognitively as well as physically. Now, prior to COVID, if you had a circle of care where you actually delegated some responsibilities of care, I would imagine that circle became smaller over the last 14 months. And I would imagine you also had some fear of accessing medical care during that time. I know I did. Instead, I used telehealth services. I was not comfortable going into a clinic. The idea of going into a hospital or the ER early on, that was a little bit concerning as well. And so the bottom line is this. We have all been going through what Bruce Feiler in his book, Life is in the Transitions, refers to as a life quake. And this is change on a magnitude that shakes everything up. Now, typically, most human beings don't have more than four or five life quakes throughout their entirety of their journey. But we've had a collective life quake. Everyone has gone through this because it's a global pandemic. So we've all been shaken to our core, which makes it even harder because there's no port in the storm. We're all going through this together. Now, Filer refers to a life quake as a massive change or a pileup of changes resulting in aftershocks for years. So the dust isn't going to settle on COVID anytime soon. And so we will continue to deal with ongoing change and ongoing uncertainty. So we're all challenged physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, and psychosocially. Every facet of our life, every facet of our being is tested. And with all of these changes and many others that you can probably add to the list, it's hard to maintain our balance. And so change has been and is frightening for a lot of us. So if you're feeling this way today, just know you are in very good company. But if we think about change, the only constant in life is change. Just reflect on that for a moment. From the moment you pop out of the womb and you take that first breath, you initiate a continuous process of change. It's called aging. <laughs> At the cellular level, we are all constantly changing. So if you think about that, it's like, well, we should be well-schooled in the nature of change then, right? We should be masters of change. But instead, we are resistant. Now, if we were all gathered in a room today, I would ask you, do you like change? And most of you would be rocking your head back and forth saying, absolutely not. And why is that? Why do we dislike and resist change? Well, according to experts in the field like Robert Kagan, it's because we have an ingrained immunity to change. We have an immune system that fights off change just like we have a biological immune system that fights off disease and infection. Well, why does that happen? Well, because we want to hang on to the status quo. We love our sense of normal. We love what is familiar. We love the idea, or at least the illusion, that we have a little bit of control. We know the rules that we play by. We know the little box that we live in. It is our comfort zone. So when life gets off track, when we are pulled into a different direction because of any kind of change, it's destabilizing. We fear losing control, and we also dislike contemplating an uncertain future. This is not our comfort zone, but change today is our collective reality. It's also our individual reality. And regardless of how much change you've had up until today, again, there is even more change ahead. So in light of that reality, what mitigates our fear of change? And how can we be inspired to confront uncertainty? How can we deal with it effectively? in a life-giving way. Well, as I alluded to in the introduction, it's knowledge. Knowledge is power. And so we need knowledge to understand the process of change. 
And I want to share with you some insights from William Bridges, who was a known expert on organizational change as well as personal change. So today, imagine you are cruising through life on your sea of tranquility and everything is going exactly as planned. So first and foremost, savor that moment because they are few and far between. So you're cruising along and then all of a sudden something happens, change. It is a situational shift. It's as if someone dropped a boulder in your sea of tranquility. And now the seas are rocking and rolling, the clouds are rolling in, storms are coming up, and you're scared. Now, what we need to recognize on this, the magnitude of the waves in our sea of tranquility will correlate directly to the magnitude of the change. So small changes, you just get a few ripples, right? You can handle that. But big changes, like we're going through today, they generate waves on the order of tsunamis that threaten to knock us off our foundation. And this is life-threatening in some situations. Now, William Bridges points out to us, and this is important to recognize, we don't fear change, the situational shift, because oftentimes we don't even know change is about to happen, but we certainly fear the turbulence of transitions after change, the consequences of change, those are the moments in time in which stability is threatened. This is when nothing seems normal, when we look out on our window to the world and we are desperately longing to go back, to go back to the status quo, to go back to what was. But the sad reality is there's no going back. That is the nature of change. Change by definition means something ends. Good health, a relationship, a life, a job, a way of life. And so life is forever changed in the aftermath of a significant disruption, a life quake in your life. So we're confronted with this idea of, well, now what? If I can't go back, what are my options? Well, I think the only way forward is first to and choose to embrace change. Doesn't mean you have to like it, doesn't mean you have to be happy about it, but this is your reality. And once embraced, you can look forward to establish realistic expectations of this journey. Now, in order to do so, as you can tell, I love images. I think in images and pictures. So I wanna give you an image of this process of change and transition because it's beneficial to be able to measure where we are in this process. So I created a model an image that I call bridge time that helps me to kind of measure how I'm going during times of change and transition. And it works in this way. Again, imagine that you are walking through the day and everything is going smoothly. You are on a straight path. It is flat. It is easy to ambulate. And then you reach a detour and you are asked to take a sharp right turn and you take a few strides and all of a sudden there is a point in time where, boom, the gradient of your path is very steep. It changes abruptly. That is the left side of this bridge. And metaphorically, that means change happened. Something's different, something's been lost, something ended. And you're standing there somewhat perplexed and now you hear roaring water and you look a little bit forward and you see a huge chasm. And there are turbulent waters of transition before you when you're thinking, how in the world am I going to get across? And you raise your eyes a little bit higher and you see this lovely bridge before you. It affords you safe passage from one side to the other, metaphorically from what was to what will be, to your past, to your future. Now, this sounds great, doesn't it? except there's a lot of hard work on this transitional bridge. As you choose to move forward, since change means something ends, you've just experienced a loss. So you're going to be grieving. You're going to be mourning some of the hardest things we do as human beings. And additionally, what this model shows you, it is a one-way bridge. The reality is we can't go back. We must move forward. 
Now, as with all models and images, that just looks fabulous, doesn't it? Except it's not quite that easy because when we are standing at the entry to that bridge and we are looking across it, we may not be able to see the other side. We don't know exactly where it's going. We don't know what that new beginning looks like. And that is why transitions are so incredibly scary. And so courage is required. Courage is desperately needed during times of transition. We must be able to confront our fear and choose to move forward one step at a time. And so it's no wonder we resist change. This is hard work to move through the transitions of life. And it takes everything we have to be brave and bold enough to transition those bridges. So how do we cross these bridges? What can help us? Well, I want to identify three guiding lights for you. These are tools that you can leverage, and perhaps you already do, but they're resilience, chosen response, and then ritual. And we're just going to touch briefly on these. So resilience is sometimes defined as the ability to bounce back from adversity. But I love Alma Marston's description of resilience in her book, Type R. She talks about transformative resilience. She said, it's the difference between those who fold and those who flourish. It is the ability to learn, to grow, and to spring forward. And that matches our idea, right, of bridge time. We can't go back, but we can spring forward. So the question becomes, well, great, but how do we do that? <laughs> what puts a little spring in our step? Well, I want to share with you a few essential ingredients to spring. The first being optimism. Optimism is the spark that ignites resilience, which means you have to hang on to hope, even in the darkest times of your life. And how do we do that? Well, we become realistically optimistic. I'm not asking you to throw on rose-colored glasses and hum kumbaya, and just be oblivious to the challenges, but instead realistically assess your situation and have the courage to look forward and see a glimmer of hope on the horizon that will motivate you to keep going. Then we need to confront our fear. We recognize that these transitions are frightening, but if we allow fear to consume us, it becomes our greatest disability. It paralyzes us at the entry point to those transitional bridges. And if we are frozen in time, life will flow around us and move on without us. So how do we conquer our fear? With knowledge about the situation, by developing new skills and adapting, by having faith in ourselves, faith in others, and faith in a higher power. And then we choose to move through this moment in time in order to live beyond it. We also need to remember we are not alone, even though there are times we feel desperately alone. Reach out for the support that you need. We will all traverse our own individual bridges, but we need folks that are cheering us on, believing in us, having confidence that we can do that. And so we need those interdependent relationships and we need to recall that we are better together. Additionally, to spring forward, we may rely on resilient role models, reflecting on the people in our lives that inspire us, perhaps our parents, our grandparents, a spouse, a partner, a child, a friend, but someone we can look to and say, hey, look how they handled their challenges. If they can do that, perhaps I can too. And I hope that you can hang on to your humor. Sometimes you just got to laugh, right? And it's not laughing at our circumstances, it's laughing despite our circumstances. It's blowing off some steam with a belly laugh. It's changing the energy in the room. It's just getting it out of our bodies so we can take a deep breath and realize, okay, what's next? What do I need to address? And then we certainly need foundational faith. However you choose to define that, I think this is equal in importance to optimism. We need to feel that we're not alone, that we've not been abandoned, 
by the sacred or the divine presence that we believed in all of our lives. Brene Brown describes faith in this way. Faith is a place of mystery where we find the courage to believe what we cannot see and the strength to let go of our fear of uncertainty. So the bottom line regarding resilience, <laughs> you gotta have humor, you gotta hang on to that. The bottom line is this, according to Amma Marston, transformational resilience provides the framework and the skills that enable us to use adversity, to use it, to leverage it, to use change and to use life's challenges as opportunities for innovation, creativity, growth, and transformation. So that's your first guiding light on these transitional bridges. Now let's talk about the second R, and this is response. Now, what I mean by this is that we can't control everything that happens in our lives, but we always retain the freedom. We always have that option to choose a response to life. And our response will determine the trajectory of our journey from that point forward. So we have a choice today and every day in how we choose to respond to change and uncertainty. And so my question to you today is this, when change happens, when you feel uncertain, are you a carrot, an egg, or a coffee bean? Now, before you answer, and before you think I've absolutely lost my mind, I want to share with you a lovely story that will reveal um, the importance of this question. A young woman went to her grandmother and told her about her life and how hard things had become recently. She didn't know how she was going to make it and she wanted to give up. She was done. She was tired of fighting and struggling and it seemed as one problem was solved, a new one arose. Her grandmother then took her to the kitchen. She filled three pots with water. In the first, she placed carrots. In the second, she placed eggs. And in the last, she placed ground coffee beans. She let them sit and boil without saying a word. In about 20 minutes, she turned off the burners. She fished out the carrots, put them in a bowl. She placed the eggs, put them in another bowl. Then she ladled out the coffee and placed it in a cup. Turning to her granddaughter, she asked, tell me, what do you see? The granddaughter kind of rolled her eyes and she said, carrots, eggs, and coffee. Well, her grandmother brought her closer and asked her to feel the carrots. She did and noted that they had gotten soft. She then asked her to take an egg and break it. After pulling off the shell, she observed the hard boiled egg. Finally, she asked her to sip the coffee. The granddaughter smiled as she tasted its rich flavor. The granddaughter then asked, what's the point, grandma? Her grandmother then explained that each of these objects had faced the same adversity, boiling water, but each reacted and responded differently. The carrot went in strong, hard, and unrelenting. However, after being subjected to the boiling water, it softened and became weak. The egg had been fragile. Its thin outer shell had protected its liquid interior, but after sitting through the boiling water, its inside became hardened. The ground coffee beans were unique, however. After they were in the boiling water, they had changed the water. Which are you, she asked her granddaughter. When adversity knocks on your door, how do you respond? Are you a carrot, an egg, or a coffee bean? Now, I think that is a lovely story, but it's also challenging because we recognize that when change and uncertainty and adversity come into our lives, the choice is ours. The choice is yours and how to respond. Will we be softened by life? Are we weakened to the point that we can't stand up to the challenge? Will we be hardened such that we close our hearts and our souls and we risk not hurting again? Or will we choose to change our environment? Will we be proactive, lean into it, 
and be a transformational presence and choose to move on with life. Well, I think it's up to each one of us, but I hope we will all remember this. We need not be victims of life. That's the importance of response. So the last R, the third guiding light is ritual. Now you may be sitting there thinking, well, how is ritual going to help me get across a transitional bridge from what was to what will be? Well, keep in mind, it's during these transitional times when everything seems so unfamiliar, feels like everything's out of control. It feels like the world is in absolute chaos and crisis, not the status quo, not the known, right? Well, if we engage and conduct ritual, perhaps a ritual we've known all of our lives, all of a sudden we are in control. We know the next steps. And so it gives us this sense of the familiar, of the normal. And we have a moment in time where we think, okay, I think I'm gonna be all right. So let's consider ritual, what is it? Well, I know some people slam ritual by saying, well, it's just rote, it's just routine. But it is so not that. Rituals are intentional and they are meaningful acts. And rituals frame ordinary time as extraordinary time. That's why they are so precious and priceless. So a quick example of the difference between ritual and routine. Every morning of the world, I come downstairs and I make a cup of hot tea. So I boil the water, throw the bag in, sip the tea, get the caffeine in my body. That's my morning routine. Now, there are times when I need a very special cup of tea. So I go into my kitchen and I pull down a very special china teapot and cup. And I will only brew constant comment tea because that's my mother's favorite tea. It was her favorite tea. And so when I smell the fragrance of the oranges and the spices, I am transported back in time to my childhood home in my kitchen, sitting with my mom at the table and we're chatting about life. And that is my intention to reconnect to those memories, to reconnect to the spirit of my mother, to reconnect to my sense of the divine and the sacred. That is ritual. So think of ritual as this huge carabiner in life that has the capacity to connect us to that which is beyond ourselves. And when everything else is out of our control, we can connect to meaning, to our sense of the sacred, to memories, to other people, to communities. And that ritual will satisfy our hunger for the familiar. It will also offer a sense of predictability of order and continuity. And so during these turbulent, uncertain times, when you are on this transitional bridge and when you encounter bridges in the future, when you're feeling destabilized, when you feel out of control, embrace life-giving daily rituals, secular or sacred, but resonate with those rituals on a daily basis and discover a life-giving balance that will serve you well. So a few parting notes before I bid you adieu for the day. If you are feeling a bit overwhelmed today, and I would imagine many of us are, whether it's because of COVID or duties of caregiving or just life in general, I have a heartfelt invitation for you today. Seek your guiding lights during this challenging time. And if you choose to become more resilient, if you choose to engage in rituals, if you want to consider a response, so much the better. But choose to hang on to hope. Realize that even during the darkest nights of our soul, if we lift our eyes to the horizon, there is the possibility of a little spark, a little glimmer that will motivate us to keep going. So choose to respond in life-giving ways. Choose to be a coffee bean. So I want to do a heartfelt little closing ritual since I was just preaching the benefits of ritual. I think this is only appropriate. And today I want to share with you a blessing 
I want to share with you a benediction that I wrote several years ago. And it really is my wish for you as a caregiver. A benediction is a short invocation in which we ask for help, blessings, and guidance. Therefore, there is no better way to conclude our conversation today about the journey of caregiving than with a benediction. We need all the help we can get as we care for each other. So as the caregiving journey unfolds one step at a time, may we all be blessed in the following ways. May we have the courage to care for each other. May we feel companioned in the caregiving journey. May we have the wisdom to prepare to care. May we have the sustaining faith to confront our fears. May we graciously offer and receive help. May we discover strength unimagined during times of loss. May we remain hopeful during the times of trial. May we recognize the sacred in the ordinary. May we engage the journey one step at a time. May we be grateful for the moment. May we humbly answer the call to care. And may we listen well love deeply, and live fully all the way to the end of the road. May it be so. So I want to highlight a few resources that you might want to check out after your conference today, after being pampered a little bit. If you're interested in other virtual training, I'm doing a lot of programming this year, and it's all online, so it matters not where you live. You can check out my website, cardinallife.com, and click on the events tab. And please know all of these programs are free of charge because I have some great community partners. If you're a reader, I wrote a book, Caregiving for the Genius, a few years ago. It's available at a lot of the libraries, but you can also purchase a copy on Amazon if you're so inclined. And if you enjoy podcasts, I just dropped a new podcast, Cardinal Musings with Jane Barton. And I create a virtual kitchen table in which I invite you to share a cup of coffee or tea with me and chat about what matters most in life. And more than anything, I just want to thank you for your time, your presence, and your attention today. And thank you for the opportunity to share a little bit of the journey with you. So I wish you and yours many blessings in the days to come. And if I can ever be of assistance to you, if you need some resources or just a compassionate ear, I would love to continue the conversation. You can contact me at cardinallife at msn.com. So I will unshare my screen and give the controls back to Kent. So thank you so much, everyone. Enjoy your day. Thank you. Thank you. Before you leave, Jane, I just want to double check. Do any of the, any questions anybody has for Jane before she departs? Wow. A silent group. <laughs> or you can share your stories. I see a hand up at the Medicare yes. Education Center. Yes. You're going to need to unmute. Hello, Hi guys. I'm supposed to remind you that it's Medicare Resource Center where we are so hi i think we've got some questions i have a question um i i know you're addressing caregivers but it seemed to me like these uh comments also are helpful for the person being cared for yeah, yeah. absolutely okay that was uh, i mean you know, uh, that was my question what about that person because it seems like my husband is going through this scared of change bit right now no, and, and you make a great point because actually I've been using this program probably for the last 15 years, but because of the nature of this gathering, I focus the comments specifically to caregivers, but it's actually appropriate for all human beings, wherever we are in our journey, because we're all challenged by change. We are all challenged by uncertainty. So um, perhaps you can share maybe something, a little takeaway that you had today with your husband as well. Thank you. I, I use an analogy. I agree 100% with Jane. And I am a visual, 
person as well, but I have, and so the picture I have in my, in my mind a lot of times when it comes to caregivers caring for family members is you're in a dance. And you're, some of the, both, of, both the caregiver and the care receiver are dealing with change. And it's kind of like, who's leading the dance? Because whenever you're dancing, at least what my grandma taught me in terms of like waltzes and stuff like that, somebody's leading the dance. So who's leading the dance? Is it the caregiver or the care receiver? And if the other person doesn't want to follow the lead, that's when you start tripping and falling and stepping on toes and everything else, which then intensifies the change and the turbulence of the change. But if it helps, everything that Jane said is very true. But imagine you and your care receiver are in a dance and who's leading the dance and how do you lead and when do you lead and will that other person allow you to lead? All of those come to mind as well. Now, I, I love that image. I've not heard you share that before, Kent. That is, that's fabulous. No, it, it works. <laughs> so maybe, maybe we combine the two and we learn how to dance across transitional bridges. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Any, any other questions? Okay. Jane, thank you. Thank you very, very much. I, oh, it's, it's always oh, my honor. It's always my delight. And you know, you could ask me anything, Kent, and I would say yes. So um, just know I, I feel so privileged to participate. And um, I just send so many blessings to all the people that put this on because you're right. This is a unique event and just just so honoring and uh, just hugs to all the caregivers that are present today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jane. Okay, um, we will now take about a five minute break. Before we break, um, 